Hello everyone, my name is Tyler Middlebrooks and I would like to welcome you to this virtual meeting. I would also like to thank the Society for inviting me here today. Today's presentation is on Seriana. Now this is a new isotope that has been FDA approved. We do consider this kind of a breakthrough in breast cancer imaging. It's, a, it's called fluoroestradiol F18. Uh, for this presentation I will refer to it as FES. It's just less, uh, less to say there, but fluoroestradiol F18. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is, is Tyler Middlebrooks. I'm a nuclear medicine technologist for at CARTAC Cancer Center in Little Rock. Also a health physicist for medical imaging consultants. There's a contact information there. If you have any questions about the presentation today or uh, just any questions in general, I'd be happy to, to answer anything you got. Financial disclosures. There are no financial disclosures for this presentation. I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Gary U. Lehner. A lot of the images uh, and uh, presentation research has been done by him. Now, he used to be at Kettering Sloan in New York, uh, but now he is at the uh, Hogue Family Cancer Institute in Newport Beach, California. Just want to thank uh, Dr. Gary U. Lehner for his research. Sariana. There are a couple subjects that we're going to go through today. Uh, here's just a brief outline of our presentation. First, we're going to go over targeted therapies. Now, uh, what exactly is a targeted therapy? We kind of go into a little bit more detail. Uh, the targeted therapies is what I feel is going to be a game changer in the cancer uh, field coming up in the next several years. Um, we're going to go over the, uh, we're going to overview uh, uh, FES or fluoroestradiol F18. We're going to go over the indications, uses, dosage, administration, safety information about the pharmaceutical. Uh, also, we're going to go over some applications, uh, interpretations, and uh, new treatments that are in the works to be coming that can come out of this in the future. Again, um, right now, uh, Seriana, it is FDA approved. Uh, hopefully, it will be rolling out to our area. Um, at the end, uh, the middle to end of this year is, is their goal, last I heard. Um, PetNet Solutions uh, are, are the distributing uh, radio pharmacy for that uh, as of now. So hopefully we'll see that soon. Okay, targeted therapy. What, what, first, what is a targeted therapy? Um, now we've kind of coined the term here recently, a theranostic. Now this is a combination of terms of therapeutic and diagnostic. So uh, what we're able to do in, is, is tag a, uh, a radiotherapy isotope. We have a linker and then a vector that we tag it to. And all that means is that we're, uh, we're able to pinpoint and localize where this therapy goes. So let's say in the breast, if there's a, a, you know, a receptor in the, in the breast that we can, we can tag, a vector to, we can also tag this isotope to it. Now these therapies are designed to be delivered systemically. So we're to start an IV, this medicine circulates the whole entire body. Anywhere in the body that these receptor cells are located, this radiotherapy tags itself to it and irradiates it. Um, now if you look over the image to the right, there's a uh, yttrium 90 and a lutetium 177. Those are kind of the uh, the main therapy agents that we use today, mostly because they're a, a pure beta or almost a pure beta emitter. All that means is that a beta, it only goes about two to three millimeters in human tissue. So, um, and that's about the width of two dimes stacked together. So it is a, an extremely small distance. So wherever this isotope uh, is locked in, it's only irradiating an extremely small area around it. Uh, which, which is extremely helpful because all of the other healthy tissue is, is near completely unaffected or completely unaffected at all. So um, if you look at the bottom one, the same thing is lutetium 177 uh, to a uh, DOTA linker and then a vector. And that is where the DOTA tate for a uh, lutetium DOTA tate comes from. But um, now they're agnostic. Now this is a term described the combination of using one radioactive drug to identify or diagnose and then a second radioactive drug to deliver a therapy or treat the main tumor and any metastatic tumors.
Okay. Lutetium-177 Dota tape. Now this is a very, very interesting study. This is kind of, uh, or in my opinion, this is the, uh, the front runner which helped develop diagnostic or uh, theranostic treatments. Um, Lutetium-177 Dota tape is used to treat adults with types of cancers known as gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, I'll just say uh, GEP-NET that is positive for hormone receptor somatostatins, including GEP nets in the foregut, midgut, and hindgut. Treatment consists of a diagnostic uh, therapy portion, PET-CT and or SPECT imaging. Now, lutetium dotatate, along with an octreotide uh, injection, has been shown to increase the progress-free survival rate from about 10% to about 60% after 24 months of treatment. Now just real quick, we, uh, we use a gallium 68 dotatate. If you look to the image to your right, uh, the bottom right there, that is a gallium 68 dotatate PET scan. It is the same dotatate that we will later tag the lutetium to, but we're able to have a PET isotope uh, a tag to it so we can do a PET scan. Now this drug uh, is designed to only go to the neuroendocrine tumor cells uh, throughout the body. Now there are some in other places, but okay, if you look to the image at the bottom right, what that's showing you is a gallium 68 PET scan. All of the, pretty much all of the bright black spots or dark black spots are uh, positive for neuroendocrine disease. After treatment, you look to the image on the far bottom right, we do a gallium 68 PET scan after the treatment and there's almost no areas uh, of abnormal activity. Now, you, you do typically see the spleen. Um, you see uh, the liver, kidneys, bladder, all those areas. That is a typical or a, a normal physiological uptake, so um, a near-complete response on that one, which is absolutely amazing. Um, the uh, lutetium treatment, the patient comes in, start an IV, we give the infusion, and uh, they have to do that several times. Uh, we have to do that four times, uh, several uh, months apart, um, but we do see a, uh, a very good response. If you look at the chart to the top, there out there is progression-free survival. Uh, that is a very, very interesting data point that can be used to uh, detect efficiency and effectiveness. Of, uh, of treatment. And uh, with the Lutathera uh, dotatate treatment, uh, progression free survival uh, is way up here instead of down at the very bottom. Targeted therapies Y90 microspheres. Now, this is a very, very interesting uh, topic. Uh, this one is one that is very dear to my heart. I've done hundreds and hundreds of these therapies. I have seen uh, complete responses. I have seen increased quality of life. These things have I've been shown to be extremely successful. I'm very proud to be able to work with these. Um, if we look here, uh, Y90 microsphere therapy is used to treat hepatic metastasis. It doesn't go anywhere else in the body. These are, these are designed just to stay um, ideally just in the liver. Uh, first CT and MRI are used to plan the tumor treatment and along with a diagnostic mapping procedure to ensure catheter placement and particle distribution. A post-PET CT scan can be used to evaluate sphere distribution and dosimetry. First, if we look over here at the image to the top right, um, that is an axial slice of a uh, patient. This is post-PET CT infusion. What this one demonstrates is that outside of that target or treatment zone, there's almost no activity at all. Uh, in fact, I don't see any activity outside of the liver and everything is pretty densely packed uh, in that left lobe of the liver. If you look here, this is a 3D model of the liver. All the green area is just normal liver. Um, the big bright red area, that is where the beads or the spheres have located. Now a catheter for this treatment, um, you go into the IR procedure room, a catheter is placed, uh, just proximal to a tumor or treatment site. Um, contrast is injected to verify 
catheter placement. The spheres are brought in. Spheres are infused, and the spheres are just bigger, just barely bigger, just a little bit bigger than capillary beds. So these things go to the ends of the capillary beds and occlude the capillaries and then start irradiating the tumor from there. So uh, very, very interesting, but you can see that there's really no activity outside of the liver and almost that whole entire left lobe of the liver, almost the whole thing is completely uh, packed. So. Lutetium-177 PSMA. Uh, now this one is in the clinical trials currently. Uh, it is extremely promising for all prostate cancer uh, treatment coming up in the next years. And this is one of the, another huge uh, leap in, in cancer research and treatment. Uh, and I'm, I can't wait to see this actually go into full clinical uh, use. So Lutetium-177 PSMA does treat castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Studies have demonstrated a high response rate to radionuclide therapy targeting prostate-specific membrane antigen, PSMA, with the radionuclide lutetium-177. LU-177 PSMA is targeted PSMA analog treatment that attaches to any prostate tissue in the body. So first, what this does for us is this is injected systemically, so in an IV, it circulates the body, it attaches itself to prostate tissue. Now for this therapy, as far as the clinical trials have gone and, and are studying, that the patient does have to have their prostate already removed. Uh, I don't know in the future if this will change or if there's any uh, other research that needs to be done, but as of now, patient prostate cancer, after the prostate's been taken out, you can give this therapy if there is prostate tissue that has metastasized anywhere in the body. The gallium 68 PSMA PET scan shows where possible tissues is uh, tissue where prostate tissue is located before and after treatment. Again, this is that theragnostic that we talked about. We have developed a diagnostic PET CT imaging agent that finds PSMA membrane tissue. So we inject this. It's a prostate. Uh, it's a PET scan. We inject it. Wait 60 to 80 minutes. We do the PET scan, and it shows us where any active prostate tissue is located. Okay, so once we have a positive uh, diagnostic exam showing that there is disease, we can do the lutetium-177 PSMA when it comes out, and uh, this circulates the body. It attaches to the exact same uh, cells that lit up on the diagnostic scan, but then it starts irradiating, and it's radiation therapy systemically. So. Any of the cells that, um, or any of the medication that's not attached to any kind of cancer cells, the kidneys filter out the medicine. So the, any extra medicine that's in the body is uh, fairly rapidly excreted through the urinary tract. So um, only the cancer cells really get irradiated and then get blasted. So um, now this image right here is a very interesting image. It actually won an image of the year award from the Society of Nuclear Medicine. If you look here, uh, up on the top left, we're just gonna go through a couple of these. First, anything that's bright red, that is active metastatic disease. So uh, if you look up on the top left, this first patient, uh, PSA is a 15. The image to the left is the pre-treatment scan. Um, you see quite a bit of red, not a whole bunch. Post. PSA was less than 0 0.1, so that is, that is amazing. And then I don't see any red in that one. So as far as we can tell, there is no metastatic prostate tissue in that body. So I'm uh, going to just keep going. Let's look at the, the one on the very bottom left. Uh, there is a whole bunch of red. Uh, that liver is almost completely full. There's some uh, abdominal uh, nodes. There's some mediastinal nodes that are lighting up. And that patient's uh, PSA was 103 on the pre-PSMA scan. And after the treatment, we, they brought them back. Patient's uh, PSA was less than 0 0.1. Absolutely amazing. And uh, for one, I don't see any uh, red areas in this body. Um, now, you, you see all the gray and the black. Those are um, what they considered uh, just normal or physiological uptake. Uh, and that is completely normal. So just have a look at this. And this is, this is absolutely amazing. And again, it did win 
an image of the year award for the Society of Nuclear Medicine. Sariana, the overview of FES. Now, Sariana is a radioactive diagnostic agent indicated for the use of positron emission tomography, PET scans, imaging for the detection of estrogen receptor positive lesions in an, adju in an adjunctive biopsy with patient recurrence of metastatic breast cancer. So what does all that mean? This medicine is designed to find HER2 positive cells, uh, receptors on any cells. So you inject this, this radiopharmaceutical, it circulates the body and it attaches to HER2 positive receptors. Okay. Imaging protocol, uh, three to six millicuries injected intravenously over about one to two minutes, preferably in a distal arm or hand. Uh, Im uh, imaging starts between 20 to 80 minutes, so this does kind of fit into the routine uh, PET imaging um, schedule. Uh, most the typical FDG PETs, it, you know, we would normally do 60 to 60 to 80 minutes typically on uh, uptake times, and this one falls right in there. We do require from the skull base to mid thigh, so that is a standard eye to thigh scan. Contraindications per the package insert, there are no contraindications. Now we do know with any radio farm, you know, pharmacy. Um, drug or any kind of radioisotope injected, you know, pregnancy, breast uh, feeding, that's always something to keep in mind. But as far as the package insert, there are no contraindications. Radiation dosimetry. Now, the critical organs for this exam include the liver, gallbladder, and uterus. Over here to the right, uh, the package insert has kind of a dosimetry chart displayed of all the organs and their uh, absorbed dose per uh, the unit that they prescribed. Radiation risks. Radiation exposure is associated with a dose dependent increased risk of cancer and ensure safe drug handling and patient preparation procedures to protect patients and healthcare providers from unintentional radiation exposure. All that came from the package insert uh, kind of routine for any, any uh, nuclear medicine. Adverse reactions. Less than 1% of the 1,207 breast cancer patients evaluated during a clinical trial observed the following. Injection site pain and loss of taste. So not a whole lot of things. Uh, most of the time you see injection site pain well, there, it was an intravenous injection. Um, maybe that means something, maybe it doesn't. But uh, very, very few people had any reactions. Uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, the same with just about any radiopharmacy uh, uh, procedure, radiopharmaceutical procedure. But uh, th their package insert says there are no available data on Seriana use in pregnant women, no radiopharmaceuticals, including Seriana, have the potential to cause fetal harm depending on the fetal stage of development and the magnitude of radiation dose. So, and then that's, I mean, any kind of a radio isotope that's used for, you know, during a, a pregnancy, it pretty much all has the same risks uh, that we know of. So, now, uh, FES, the physical characteristics of Seriana, is, it is a radio-labeled F18. Uh, so this is a cyclotron-produced radionuclide that decays by positron emission to a stable oxygen. And this is, again, so far, is the exact same as FDG, F18, same isotope. It has a half-life of 109.8 minutes. The principal photon used for diagnostic imaging are the coincidence pairs of 511 keV gamma photons. So if you look over here to the right, this is uh, for under external shielding. Um, uh, external shielding, six centimeters of lead equivalent to shield a 511 keV photon, 99% uh, shielded. This is about the equivalent of 12 standard lead aprons um, stacked all on top of each other. I did weigh mine, and uh, that would be about 120 pounds of lead to wear to attenuate uh, essentially all of the radiation from this. So 
that's why nuclear medicine typically doesn't wear lead uh, because they would have to wear, for pet, they'd have to wear 12 lead aprons to attenuate. I'll look over here to the right. This is a chart that shows the um, uh, thickness of lead needed to attenuate. So we do need uh, about six uh, centimeters of lead to block near 100%. So, um, pharmacokinetics, um, FES, F18 is metabolized by the liver and then it is uh, then eliminated through the biliary and urinary excretions. So and that's why uh, the liver and the gallbladder are some of the, uh, the main critical organs. Okay, seriana applications. Now these are the five uh, main things that we can use this uh, exam to do. I will say that number one, that is, that is the number one reason why we would use it. Uh, so overall, we can uh, determine the ER status of, of metastatic lesions. So if we do have, a, typically, if a patient uh, becomes has a has a biopsy, they they are then you know diagnosed with breast cancer. A lot of times they'll do different scans depending on what is needed by the patient. But uh, if there are several things in question, instead of going in and biopsying a bunch of stuff, um, you can do a, a FES PET scan, and this will at least tell you the ER status of the metastatic lesion. It is really um, beneficial to also have a FDG or a glucose metabolism PET scan to see where any active glucose uh, uh, metabolic lesions are located. And then this test can be done to evaluate the uh, HER2 status of those lesions. Uh, also real quick, we'll go through uh, inv uh, invasive lobular breast cancer assess ER status and lesions, difficult to biopsy, problem solving tools, selective doses for novel ER uh, targeting therapies and clinical trials. So uh, this can be used for a fairly wide variety of things. So, uh, but again, the, uh, the main application for Seriana or FES is determining the ER status in metastatic lesions. Determining the ER status and metastatic lesions. Predict progressive free survival. Assess whole body ER heterogeneity. Predict response to endocrine therapy. Breast, uterine, uh, this does work for breast, uterine, and ovarian cancers. Now, real quick, um, progression free survival. Um, that, uh, unless you've read a lot about it or just, just so happen to know a lot about it, this is kind of a you know, what, what does that really mean? So progression-free survival is the length of time during and after treatment of a disease that the patient lives with the disease but does not get worse. So that is uh, kind of what we call uh, in remission. You do have, may still have the, the cancer or the disease, uh, but we've treated it and stunned it and put it in its place, and it's not getting any worse over a long period of time. So that's really not a curative thing but uh, it is to stun it and prevent the spread and progression. So progression-free survival. Overall survival is the length of time from the diagnosis of the disease to the end of the patient's life. So um, if you look over here to the right, uh, what we can see, and uh, this is where it gets kind of interesting. So uh, the first uh, image there on the top left, that is an FES uh, PET scan. You see a uh, breast lesion, and its SUV value is 1.5. You look over to the right, that is an FDG, or a routine PET scan, and the, the SUV is 2.5. So both exams show fairly high activity in that breast lesion. Okay, so on a different patient, we go down one. The, FE, the FES scan, uh, the lesion that they're looking at, that's a paratracheal lymph node, there's, there's almost no uptake. You can, I mean, you can barely see something there. The SUV value is 0 0.6. Now, if you look to the right, the FDG is 5.9. So it has, this exam has a very low um, FES uptake and a fairly or real high FDG uptake. Okay, go down one more. 
Okay, if you look down, there's an L2 um, vertebral lesion. On the FES scan, it is 3.4, so that is pretty high. And on the PET scan, um, the F, uh, FDG PET scan, uh, it is 6.3. Okay, so there's several things right now what that tells us. Uh, first, if it is um, very hot on the FDG scan and on the FES, it is, uh, for one, that that tells you that the, the, the HER2 treatment is going to work well. Now, the, the patient B there, they had a very, very low uptake uh, and then a pretty high uptake on the FDG, which would uh, kind of suggest that the HER2 treatments uh, would not probably not work very well. And on the bottom one, um, it, it says pretty much the same thing, that um, uh, both of them are fairly high. And um, if you look around, it looks like all of the lesions on the regular PET uh, lineup and match on the FES, which would tell you that all of the tumors that are uh, noted are HER2 positive. Okay, let's have a study real quick. Uh, the first thing I want you to look at is the uh, exam that had the high FDG avidity and the low FES avidity. So uh, that would be patient B. You see the real high FD, uh, FES uptake at 0 0.6. Okay, that's patient B there. Um, what that shows us is that uh, on a, over here at chart A, it's that green line. The progression-free survival rate was just less than 10 months. Um, the overall survival rate um, was right at 100 months. Okay, so that's, uh, that's not that good. Now, if we look at the, um, the one that has the high FDG avidity and the high FES avidity, which uh, would, would be in, on the chart to the left or the image to the left, patient A and C, they both have high FDG and high FES. Um, now, that, uh, that patient uh, or those patients are said to have uh, approximately 40 months of progression-free survival uh, and then greater than 120 months of overall survival. Um, what, that, what that means is that, um, or what that shows is the predictability of treatment. Okay, I want everybody to just take a look at this image over here to the right. Um, what that overall is showing us that if a FES scan is above a certain threshold, you can predict the, the patients that are going to respond to therapy versus non-responders. So there's a certain threshold about uh, that one and a half. Um, pretty much almost not necessarily guarantees, but it strongly suggests that they a likely patient to respond to her uh, positive uh, treatment. Uh, what we do is we expect all her positive uh, lesions to respond to hormone therapies because they are hormone positive. We'd expect them to be, uh, to respond to treatment. Now, uh, Washington University at St. Louis uh, studied 40 patients with ER positive breast cancers where 21 patients responded to treatment and 19 didn't. So that just off the bat, that kind of makes you feel that's you know, half and half. That's uh, that's not. It's not very good at all. Uh, it does, but it but it does show us one thing that uh, it shows all lesions that are less than 1.3 SUV had no response to treatment. Okay, so if you do, uh, as far as this study is concerned, if you do an FES PET CT scan and a lesion that you're suspecting or, or that you're evaluating is less than 1.3 there's a good chance that that won't even uh, respond to treatment. Um, now, there is no guarantee of treatment response, uh, but if you look over there uh, to the right again, um, let's look at uh, if, you know, if the SUV value is a 2 on the exam, uh, there's what, maybe uh, 1, 2, 6. There might be six patients out of all of the patients there um, would respond. So that, uh, that does right there um, gives you a little bit more confidence in, um, um, 
and what kind of therapy is needed. Okay, so the conclusion for this study, and again, we're still looking at this same, it's a fairly simple chart, but it, uh, it, it does show us a lot of predictive information. So SUVs on the FES scan, that's greater than 1.3, 65.6 of the patients responded to hormone therapy. SUVs greater than three, 84% responded to treatment. SUVs greater than six, 100% responded to therapy. Now, if the SUV is less than three, only 40%, uh, only 40% responded, and the SUV is less than 1.3, none, uh, there was no response to treatment. So, um, uh, the predictive value with this exam um, could have a huge impact in uh, cancer treatment and uh, predicting response rates. So. Okay, now number two, uh, invasive lobular breast cancer. Okay, this right here is a pretty, uh, pretty interesting. If you look all uh, through all here, I have over on the left, there's kind of a little key, uh, red arrows or bone lesions, red uh, dotted arrows or recurrent disease, and red kind of hook uh, arrows are liver metastasis. Okay, in patient one, I'll just kind of go through a couple of these. Um, you have a, a, a bone lesion there in the hip, and on the PET scan, you have a probable benign lesion up in the chest somewhere, and then you still kind of faintly see that bone lesion. So that probable benign lesion is, is one of the areas uh, or a pitfall of an FDG. It kind of shows you, because um, uh, it can show you inflammate, chronic inflammation, and so that is a positive on the exam, but it's a probable benign uh, FDG uptake. So go to this uh, patient number two, and we see uh, there's a, um, uh, a hip lesion there, and on the FES scan, there is lesions throughout almost the whole entire uh, skeletal system. Um, Remember, you should really only see the liver, maybe the kidneys and the bladder, and the gallbladder, but all of this bone uptake, that's positive bone disease. And, and then when you did the uh, FDG PET scan, there's, it's, a, it's almost a routine study. Uh, there's a small uptake in that, uh, go over here, uh, patient number five. Uh, if you look, there's a, uh, the uh, FES, does show a very, very mild uptake in the chest, uh, and that, what they're marking here is a, it's unclear in etiology, and it does have a, and they do have a, a bone lesion there in the, in the pelvis somewhere. And then on, on that same patient, the FDG scan was all clear. So with the FES, we had a definite positive and a probable or unclear etiology with an all uh, all clear FES so, or FDG. Now these uh, last two patients, they showed more, um, the FDG did show more or lesions that were, were missed by the um, FES scan. So we'll look at this last patient here. There's a bone lesion on the FES that it really wasn't picked up on the, um, the FDG PET scan. But what we're able to see on the FDG, this liver metastasis showed up, and due to the high uptake in the FES in the liver, liver metastasis can be um, kind of camouflaged or hidden, or um, it just makes it very difficult to see. So um, both exams are extremely helpful. This FES uh, will, you know, has the ability to differentiate uh, different etiologies uh, in the body. So, now lobular breast cancer can be very difficult to evaluate on FDG pets. Evidence of false positives on FDG pets, um, those are all the green arrows that we saw as you look through that image. We'll go back to it just for a second. All the green arrows, there we go, are false positives on the, the regular pet. Five FES patients showed greater lesion detection. Uh, two detection. So I really feel like these two exams um,
coming into the future are going to start working more hand in hand uh, with breast cancer imaging. Okay. Uh, FES appears extremely valuable in evaluating patients with uh, lobular breast cancers. May be helpful to evaluate and rule out lesions not seen on FDG pets when clinically indicating disease. So this is a pretty, uh, pretty interesting image itself. Um, so uh, th uh, this uh, top row, uh, FES, uh, image A, you can see a physiological bowel uptake that's, uh, that is normal, but then you see this, uh, this lesion with, by the red arrow there. Uh, and then on the same, uh, the same exam, uh, well, the same patient, but the FDG exam, neither one of those showed up. Uh, C, they're both the uh, CTs from each exam. Um, there's no, it does look, uh, the bones do look kind of mottled, but there's no definite um, bone metastasis that can be identified, and they look roughly the exact same. But then on, again, on the, the FES, you see this uh, bone lesion here. And then on the FDG, you see nothing. So it was completely a cult on the FDG uh, pet imaging and the CT, but it uh, was apparent or greater appreciated on the FES exam. Number three, assessing ER status in lesions that are difficult to biopsy. Um, this, uh, just really one thing jumps out. I mean, you can use this in all sorts of clinical, uh, in, in all sorts of clinical cases, but if you have a look here, um, in brain metastasis, meta metastatic versus new primary. Uh, brain uh, metastasis is always something that we are concerned with with breast cancer patients. Um, and if you have a patient that all of a sudden you find this on a CT, um, MRI, and you may not want to necessarily biopsy, you know, um, right in the center of their brain, um, you can use this exam to evaluate um, the ER status. Uh, if it is a patient that is uh, HER2 positive, then you would really assume that if it is a metastatic breast cancer, it's probably going to be HER2 as well. It's probably going to be the same type, most likely. Um, so what we can do is evaluate lesions difficult to biopsy in the brain, mediastinum, periaortic, uh, vertebral body, spine. Uh, the list can kind of go on, whatever uh, the clinician feels that it is a difficult place to biopsy. But a quick diagnostic scan can show if there is any HER2 uh, positive lesions. In this exam, uh, over here to the right, you can see this red arrow big bright uh, spot in the head, the fuse shows it was hot, and then the CT, it's very apparent that, it's a, uh, that it is a lesion there. So, very good image there. Okay, number four, problem solving tools. Okay, problem solving tools, uh, avoiding lung biopsies with PET scans, um, evaluating known tumor types for FDG PET and FES PET, Okay, over here, this is a case study of a 58-year-old female breast cancer patient post-FDG PET scan. Shows a 5.5 SUV on an FDG scan with tissue sampling recommended. After the FES scan, shows lung mass having an SUV of 6.3. It is highly suggestive this lesion is uh, estrogen receptor positive or 2 positive metastatic breast cancer and not a new lung primary. So in this case, a biopsy would not have been necessary. Of course, any kind of research, they're going to double check. So they did end up going back, doing a biopsy, and proving what they found with the FES PET scan to be true. That again, this is a, a ER positive metastatic breast to the lung and not a new primary. Number five. Selective dose of novel ER targeting therapies and clinical trials. So here is a study where we did this exam. Uh, if you look at the top row of the images up on the left, what you can see is that there's fairly extensive metastatic disease uh, throughout the skeletal system. 
What they did is they waited 31 days, uh, that's two cycles, three days into the chemo regimen, and then re-scanned. Uh, um, if you look at uh, this, the second row, um, it looks like all of the uh, skeletal lesions are uh, completely resolved. If you look over at the chart on the right, uh, what that shows, uh, anything that's blue is uh, greater than 90% of the lesions have uh, resolved, and if it's red, greater than 90% of the lesions remain. Um, and what this allows you to do is to evaluate the dosage of the treatment to see if there are any receptors that are available. If you look at the first one, uh, one patient that was, the dosage was enough, that was 200 times, uh, 200 milligrams every day. Uh, if you go down a little bit further, they bumped it up to 300 milligrams three times a day, and it looks like um, all of those patients did see a greater than 90% decrease in a FES SUV, uh, but two or three of them were real close to the threshold. Uh, it looks very apparent that the, uh, the last two columns there, uh, 400 milligrams three times a day, um, all three patients had great response, along with the 800 milligrams every day uh, had great response as well. Uh, so this is just a way that we can use FES to determine uh, dosing during clinical trials. Normal interpretation. Uh, the normal biodistribution of the FES PET CT scan, uh, you, you typically, you'll always see the liver, gallbladder, small bowel, uh, renal collecting system, bladder, and you'll also see uh, in the injection site uh, vascular tracking. Uh, that is uh, th that is normal. Um, it's just uh, just what happens whenever the medication is is. So we do like to try to keep um, uh, the injection sites in the distal uh, upper extremities, uh, just to kind of to to suppress that uh, that artifact slightly. If you notice, um, there's two normal exams here. One is a wide uh, windowing that allows you to evaluate the, the liver, the biliary tract, where when you have a little bit tighter windowing, all of that kind of blacks out, but you're able to get a little more detail in, a, in the uh, outer portion of the body outside of the, uh, the abdomen. So uh, whenever you're evaluating these exams, you do need to be able to to switch back from the intensity levels to evaluate that liver uh, and biliary system. Abnormal distribution. Any of the uptake outside of the normal distribution uh, is considered abnormal. Um, the image to the left that is widespread metastatic disease, liver metastasis, um, thoracic lymph nodes, uh, pelvic lymph nodes, you just can look and there seems like there's something almost everywhere you look. There's um, rib lesions, uh, vertebral bodies. You look over to the image to the right, all of that is gone. That's a normal exam versus an abnormal exam. Uh, in almost every case, if there is uptake outside of the normal distribution pattern, it is considered to be pathological. Okay, FES avidity. So again, lesions uh, that are FES avid, that is greater than 1.5, um, are highly, highly suspicious for um, HER2 positive uh, disease. This is the image we had earlier that uh, you can see for one, it is completely occult uh, or not seen on the CT and FDG scan, but um, it is uh, made apparent on the FES exam and it is, again, a cult on the CT portion of that, so. Okay, so primary breast malignancy, um, the optimal imaging modalities are still going to be mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. This is not an exam to think that, hey, I can get this exam done and, you know, see if I have cancer or not. That's not the purpose of this. Um, uh, mammography, ultrasound, MRI, those are the primary mo imaging modalities for breast cancer. Those need to be used first. 
the FES PET scans need to be used as a, uh, a diagnostic tool to assist in uh, the findings of MAMO ultrasound and MRI. So. Okay, um, so interpreting bone lesions, we've kind of touched on this already, uh, but interpreting bone lesions, osteous metastasis uh, may be FES avid even if it's occult on the CT and FDG PET. That's what we've, we've kind of gone over already. This, uh, this red, uh, red spot here, that um, is completely unseen on both the CTs and the FDG. And that, that, is, uh, that is pretty typical, especially of lobular breast cancers. Okay, uh, lung lesions. So uh, round lung nodules are suspicious even if not FES avid. Um, that's the thing for uh, uh, FDG, FES. When the physician or, or yourself as a technologist sees that there's a lung nodule and there's no activity, it, if it's small, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is or isn't malignant. Um, it just makes it extremely um, difficult to see, um, does make it very suspicious, uh, and does need follow-up. So, Okay. Um, also, uh, some more about lungs. Not all FES avid uptake is metastatic or cancer. So uh, the image to the right, you see these lungs. Um, the CT morphology is extremely uh, valuable in this interpretation. But we are able to see um, uh, shadows of the lungs that shouldn't be there. Um, again, it's not metastatic disease, but this is post-radiation fibrotic changes. Um, that has been shown uh, with mild FES, uh, FES avid, avidity in the lungs. So uh, if we look there, that right there doesn't mean that the hole outside of the lungs are mildly cancerous. That's a, that is a radiation change seen after therapy. Okay, adrenal lesions in FES PET. Um, typical, whenever, typically when we see an FDG PET with a... a hot uh, adrenal lesions, the first thing that kind of pops into our head is, is what is it? It's an adenoma, uh, most likely. Um, so then, then, then you have to look over at your CT, get your Hounsfield units, and evaluate, you know, is this an adenoma or could this be a metastasis? Um, as far as we know, adrenal lesions uh, can have FDG avidity, but so far we haven't seen any FDG avidity in, I'm sorry, we haven't seen any FES avidity in the Seriana or uh, FES PET scans. So if you see hot adrenal nodules, there's disease in the adrenal nodules, um, most likely, at least, uh, at least with all the studies that we've seen. Hot adrenal nodules on FES is a, is a positive indication that there's metastatic disease in the adrenal nodules. Okay, uh, FES, a heterogeneity of metastasis. Um, this is a pretty interesting uh, uh, group of images. First, the image is to the right. We've seen that. We've seen. <clears throat> we've seen that one already, um, and it pretty much shows us the same thing: FES versus FDG activities in different patients. Um, but the heterogeneity of metastasis. This is this is pretty interesting because what when you use the FDG and FES um, uh, together, you can see, uh, and what you'll start seeing is there's lesions that are mismatched. Um, if they're hot on the regular PET and then they're cold on the FES, that doesn't mean that the disease isn't there. That only means that there are um, that there's no uh, HER2 positive receptors there. Um, so what, a lot of times, what you'll see is that there are you know the patient might be a HER2 positive breast cancer patient, uh, but then there are lesions in the liver that are cold on the FES and hot on the PET. So this image over here to the left. Um, first, um, uh, this may make some lesions more FES avid and other lesions more FDG avid in the same patient. So, um, the image to the left, FES scan, you see this nice um, even liver. Um, you do see the biliary tree that's real bright. But up in the top um, left uh, lobe of the liver, you see this kind of um, uh, circular uh, area with uh, low activity uptake. Then you look over on the CT and you see this, you know, kind of dark area. Well, one, you can look at the CT and see, you know, well, is that a cyst? It does 
kind of look like a cyst, but that density is nowhere near, uh, it doesn't look like a cyst. There's uh, densities inside it, but uh, the FES is, is cold, okay? Uh, when you look down here on the FDG scan, CTs look, CTs look the same on both of them, but then the FDG is positive. Um, what that one al allowed you to do is see um, that that lesion one, you can tell by this, the uh, CT without that it's not a a uh, cyst, but it is it is still positive nevertheless. Um, so in the FES on these liver lesions, it can uh, it's it's not hot, but it does look suspicious on the on the uh, uh, the AC image, and then the CT image uh, on these becomes very valuable because you can look at that alone and say, well, that's probably a metastasis and it has a uh, cold, lead, cold spot over here on the FES. Then if you wanted to double check yourself, you could always do an FDG PET scan and that does show FDG avidity to uh, that left lobe. And you could do that without a biopsy. Okay, here's some more um, uh, slides on the uh, interpreting pre and post treatment. Now, Again, if you uh, treat during the cycle, um, really right after a therapy, it, um, what we're able to see is that pre-treatment, you see this, let's look at this uh, image to the left, you see this bright uh, vertebral lesion, you got the red arrow there. Um, Post-treatment, uh, it's cycle, uh, cycle two, day three, so, uh, well, that's actually 31 days um, after the, the first uh, treatment. Uh, you see an extremely low uh, uptake. Um, now that doesn't mean, again, within 30 days that the cancer is, is gone or cured or, or nearing it cured. That just tells you that the receptors are all tied up with the treatment. And that's what you want, is because the, the hormone treatment, uh, not only does it um, hinder the growth, but uh, it also tries to reverse it or, or kill it. So um, when you see these, um, that close to treatment, that doesn't, uh, you just need to have that in the back of your mind that uh, that just shows you that treatment is working and um, there are no lesions that are not being treated. So, and then uh, 31 days post the first treatment, again, this is cycle two, day three. Um, uh, you see, uh, I don't see any uh, avid uh, lesions throughout that exam. So uh, that patient right there, the dosage is appropriate. The one over here, it is almost appropriate um, using that uh, research from Washington University of St. Louis um, that there are still uh, areas that are not, uh, the, the dosage is not up to par. So this is kind of interpretation pitfall. If treatment is given too soon, um, you really, um, it doesn't help you a whole lot uh, unless you're wanting to evaluate uh, uh, treatment dosage in this case. So. Um, so some current research, uh, and this is uh, really uh, the kind of cool stuff that's going to be coming down the way that, that I'm really excited for. Um, uh, experimental studies using uh, Herceptin, okay? Uh, so we, they use uh, targeted uh, LU177 Herceptin that appears to be promising for new targeted therapy. Okay, so over here on the right, you see a CT inspect, uh, a, a, day, in, a day of infusion, you see um, some breast uptake there over on the right uh, and the left of the breast, uh, developing this um, lutetium-177 uh, Herceptin radioimmunotherapy or HER2 expressive breast cancer and its feasibility in assessing breast cancer in breast cancer patients. Um, they were able to see a dramatic decrease in her HER2 uptake bilateral breast uh, masses five days post-infusion. Um, so what we're able to see is we did this exam. You see all this breast lesions that are positive. You do the LU-177 Herceptin treatment. Now that in itself, just think about this. This is Herceptin, so that is a breast cancer chemotherapy that is then tagged to a therapy agent, a radiotherapy. So this within itself is a systemic chemo radiation combo cocktail. That right there, I feel, has a huge potential not only to, to help uh, treat breast cancer, but 
to then kind of springboard all these other cancers that we have these great chemos for, but they work real good and then, you know, kind of uh, by possibly adding a radiotherapy, um, a, a, you know, a patient may be able to, you know, instead of having to pick, well, you know, I'm not, the patient's not quite healthy enough for, uh, you know, chemo and radiation therapy. So, you know, we're going to pick one or the other that gives the patient the best chance of survival. Um, that maybe we can give both um, in the future and not only just slow the progression, but stop progression almost uh, completely and, and hopefully have a little bit more of a, a strive for a complete cure um, once a patient is diagnosed. Uh, instead of just we're going to slow this thing down as slow as we can go and just see where we get. Uh, this right here, the, the research that this could, uh, could implement is, is absolutely amazing. I am uh, thrilled that I'm in the field at this time and that um, hopefully in my lifetime, my career time here, we'll see just leaps and bounds in uh, cancer treatment. And I feel, again, I feel like we're right on the cusp of seeing something amazing. Uh, with this stuff, and it's uh, it's certainly not slowing down. So, again, uh, uh, for applications for this exam, the FES PET scan, uh, Seriana is the name brand of it. Uh, this is to determine the ER status of metastatic lesions. Um, one thing that we, you know, want to keep in the back of our mind is the heterogeneity, where you may have a HER2 positive breast lesion, but then you have, um, you know, some lymph nodes in the abdomen or the chest that are uh, her negative. Um, and this will let us uh, let the physician know, you know, what treatments need to be given. Will this treatment work on all the lesions? Will it work on some of the lesions? What, you know, what exactly needs to be done? Again, uh, this, uh, this little chart, it, it, what, it's, what this exam allows us to do is evaluate the, uh, as to predict your response to treatment by using this exam. Um, so if all of your lesions, again, if all of your lesions are, let's say you got a you know, pretty aggressive cancer, all of your lesions are you know, between three and six, you have an extremely high chance of responding. Where if all your lesions are you know, three to you know, all less than three, uh, that treatment may not be very effective and you can go to a next line so when will uh, FES or Seriana be available in our area? PetNet Solutions and Zeri, uh, Zerionexa USA FDA has been FDA approved. Seriana FES um, will become commercially available at the beginning of 2020, early 2021 through PetNet Solutions. And so when exactly will we have it? I've asked several different people and everyone as far as the, uh, the Arkansas area Arkansas, Texas, uh, Missouri, Oklahoma, Mississippi area. We are looking to have it um, in late 2021. So hopefully we've, we already have it or we'll have it real soon and um, we'll be able to, uh, to start utilizing this potentially extremely powerful exam. Acknowledgements. Uh, first, I want to uh, uh, thank Dr. Gary Ulaner. Um, he was previously with the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York and has recently changed the uh, Hogue Family Cancer uh, Institute. But I'd like to thank him um, for all his research using FES, FDG evaluations, which made it possible for me to give you this presentation today. Uh, again, my name is Tyler. Um, I'm a radiological technologist and health physicist here in the state. And um, just wanted to thank you guys again for having me. If you do have questions uh, about this presentation, uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, uh, you can shoot me an email. I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions you may have.